If you have your Bible, let's go with me to book of Acts and I want you to open chapter 27 and just keep it open there. I'm gonna start reading it in just a moment but I want you to open to chapter 7 and we're gonna get to this in just a moment. But the Bible highlights three main storms in the scriptures that most of you are aware of. The first storm and you probably have heard of this one is the Jonah's storm. Somebody say Jonah's storm. Can you say it a little bit louder? Jonah's storm. I just wanted the second sanctuary to hear that. So Jonah's storm is unique because as you see behind me, it was caused by God because of his disobedience to God. And then this storm was stopped when Jonah obeyed God's call. It's important to highlight not every storm is the same. Now when I talk about storm, I'm not talking about a wind right now, physical. I'm talking about life's challenges that happen to us. Sometimes we attribute all of our storms to the devil. We're like, when bad devil is attacking me. But some of storms that we experience are because of our disobedience to God's call. Sometimes we make a storm because we make bad decisions. Jonah didn't necessarily did a bad decision because he chose to be with somebody wrong or do drugs or dupe somebody financially but Jonah disobeyed the call of God and ran the opposite and the scripture says and the Lord caused a storm not to punish him but to wake him up and redirect him. Can I just take a moment and mention something that as a Christian your aim shouldn't be not to sin your aim should be to please God. So many Christians set a standard for their life too low. I just wanna, don't want to smoke, drink, get high or hang out with those who do. That's a very low standard. Your standard should be I want to please God. There are many people who don't drink, who don't smoke, who don't sleep around, who pay their taxes and they're very good but they're not obedient to the call of God on their life. God didn't just save you so you stay away from drugs. God saved you so you can be in the center of His will and do what He called you to do on this earth. Some of you are called to sing. Some of you are called to run a business. Some of you are called, you know, all of us are called to raise our families. But some of us are called to go into other nations and preach the good news. Some of us are called to be missionaries. Some of us are called eventually to plant a church and to start a church. Some of us are called to open our home and not just to host birthday parties and quinceaneras but to actually hold a life group. Some of us are called not just to have a nice car but to give somebody a car who maybe is a young family that, that is struggling financially. When you run from the call of God, you will run into a storm. The scripture says about Jonah, Jonah ran from the presence of God. I was wondering about that agent. How could he be running from the presence of God? It's not that God is not anywhere. It's not talking about God's omnipresence. It's talking about God's manifest presence in Jonah's life. When you run from the call, you run from God's manifest presence. While God is everywhere, His presence on your life, His conviction, His, His, His moving in your life will be lifted off until you get redirected to the call of God. The second most important decision in your life after giving your life to Jesus is when you give your life to the call of God. And many of us do not want to do the call of God. Why? Because for example for Jonah, he didn't like Ninevites. At that point, Ninevites conquered Israel. So they were the captors. So Jonah had a prejudice against them. He's like, I don't like those people. I want them to burn in hell. And maybe some things that God called you like, I don't like to do that. But you have to understand, if you disobey the call of God, you will find yourself in a storm. And it's not because God is punishing you, it's because God is redirecting you. Amen. That's the first storm in the Bible. The second storm in the Bible, and if you're taking notes, write, it, write this down, is Jesus' storm. And this storm, Jesus faced while following the will of God. And the way he overcame this storm is because he spoke to this storm and he commanded the sea to be quiet. 
So Jonah ran from the will of God. Jesus was the will of God. And then Paul was in the will of God. Jonah, he had a storm. And in this storm, they had to throw Jonah out of, out of the boat. And the storm calmed. Jesus in his storm had to rebuke the storm. And the storm was calm. And Paul, as we're going to see in a moment, had to learn how to swim. Some of you are in a storm because you got wrong people in your boat. Throw them off the board. Some of you are in a relationships. If you remove that person from your relationship, you will be totally free. Some of you are in the places that is just so toxic and it's so bad. And you're asking God to change those things when God is asking you to walk away from those things. You can't be going to a club and say, God, change this place. No, get rid of them. Don't be there. Throw Jonah overboard. Some of you got kids in your house that are 25 years of age, spoiled brats, acting like Jonah, and they're causing storm. What you got to do is put their stuff in the back and put them outside of the house. And say, home slice, if you don't obey the rules in this house, you cannot be under this roof. I love you. I will pray for you. Go to the homeless shelter. Yeah. And you will find so much peace. But what will happen to them? God will find them a fish called homeless shelter. And they'll come to their senses. Because as long as you keep enabling a behavior in your home of your children that are adults that are disrespecting you and disrespecting the roles of the house, you're not helping them. You're enabling them. Amen. I know your kids are not going to like me right now, but that's fine. The Lord can change them. If you throw them off the board, off the boat, let them go. Let the Lord work on them. Sometimes we have those relationships in our life that are causing so much hurt and pain and we just got to distance ourselves, the storm will stop. Jesus is in the storm and Jesus' storm, He didn't throw any disciples off the boat. He didn't throw Peter off the boat. He didn't throw Judas off the boat because in this storm, there was a resistance to the will of God that Jesus carried and Jesus slept in the storm and then Jesus spoke to the storm and see that's exactly what sometimes we have to do when you are in the will of God we're not talking about if you're not in the will of God if you're not in the will of God there are things we need to remove and sometimes we need to redirect our life and repent when you are in the will of God and you experience resistance that is demonic you experience resistance that is just coming from the enemy fear comes in doubt comes in what you gotta learn to do is what the Lord Jesus Christ did he slept in the storm and then he spoke to the storm I truly believe people that can speak to the storm are the ones who can first learn to sleep in the storm. As a Christian, you have power of God in your mouth. Power of life and death is in your tongue. You can speak to the mountain. You can speak to your emotions. You can speak to the, even to the atmosphere in your home. And you can rebuke the enemy. Jesus did that and so can you. But the reason why so many of us cannot speak to a thing is because we don't have God's peace to sleep in the thing first. Learn to sleep in the storm, not because you're careless, but because you know He cares for you and He got you. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, He got me. <laughs> Jesus rebukes Peter during this storm because Peter wasn't not only sleeping, Peter was in panic, full-blown panic. And Jesus says, you of little faith. Forward with me to book of Acts, I think chapter 12. And Peter is now in jail, bound, if I'm not mistaken, 16 men. And the next day he's facing a trial. Now those trials, pretty much it guaranteed Peter's execution. And the scripture says God sends an angel and the angel comes in the room and you see Peter sleeping before his trial. He's not thinking about, oh man, they're going to kill me. What's going to happen to my wife? What's going to happen with my kids? Man, oh man, God, please rescue me. Peter is not even praying. He's at so much rest that Peter is chained to men who are going to drag him and tomorrow he probably will be executed. And Peter is... I think he was snoring as well. Peter, how could you do that when you're facing a trial? Because see, little faith panics in the storm. Great faith sleeps in the storm. And Peter's faith grew. 
When he was in Jesus' storm, Peter was panicking, throwing water out. Jesus, wake up, we're dying. Now his faith grew. Jesus is not there, but the Holy Spirit is there. He's in jail and he's sleeping. And the next day he wasn't executed. God spared his life. Because I believe when the storm is caused by the enemy, God will give you peace that passes understanding. You don't know how you're peaceful. You just are peaceful. You don't know how the answer will come. You just know God has the answer and He's got me. That's why I told you to ask your neighbor and tell your neighbor, God's got me. He will get me through this. And then you have this boldness. When the enemy comes against you, you can speak against the enemy. No, not in some weird, crazy way, but in an authoritative way. You say, devil, get behind me. Move in Jesus' name, because I'm a child of God. Amen. Third storm, and this is Paul's storm. Now Paul's storm, if you're taking notes, write this down. Paul faced this storm because he was caught in the consequences of others' mistakes. He survived this storm by persevering, swimming, and holding on to broken pieces. I need to talk to somebody this morning. Because some storms are caused because somebody else made a decision that affected you. For example, during COVID, government made decisions that affected businesses. Some of you are dealing with issues right now because your daddy made a decision to leave your mama and that has hurt you. There are people today, maybe you're a woman and you're raising children on your own because that man made a decision to leave you and the mistake of other people puts you really in the crossfire and you're living the consequences of decisions that are not yours but somebody else's. It is probably the worst storm to be in. Because when the devil causes the storm, you raise faith against him. When you made a mistake of your own, throw Jonah overboard. Change, repent and that storm stops. This storm is different. Your employer decides to downsize. You're affected by that. Somebody decides to make a decision and it directly affects you and it could be a wrong decision and you're suffering the consequences. It feels so unfair. It's not right. How dare they do that? They didn't consider my life. But that's exactly what happened in this case. Paul warns the captain of the ship. We can't travel right now. But the Bible says the captain of the ship trusted, not Paul. And he made a decision to go ahead into the sea and they encounter the storm. What do you do when you are in the storm and you are experiencing consequences of someone's decisions? I'm going to leave you today with seven things to do. I want you to pull out your notebook and I want you to take these because I believe they will be instrumental in helping you to navigate the next season of your life. Number one, forgive those people who are responsible for the storm you are facing right now. Paul in book of Acts 27 verse 21 it says, But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, <laughs> I love this, Man, you should have listened to me. You guys should have listened to me. And then he said this, And have not sailed from Crete, and incurred this disaster and loss. Paul is not minimizing what they did. He's not downplaying it. But you don't see the rest of the story in Paul's heart. Bitterness, resentment, and hate. The enemy will cause you to drown in your storm if you are loaded with unforgiveness. Now bitterness feels fair. When you're angry at somebody who made decisions that hurt you, you have a right to be angry. You also have a right to hold on to bitterness. But as long as you're holding on to bitterness, the devil is holding on to you and he will drown you in that storm. You got to forgive those people. Why? Because Christ is forgiven you. Why? Because unforgiveness will damage you as much as whatever they did. Unforgiveness is drinking a rat poison, hoping for a rat to die from it. 
You're not hurting your ex by being bitter at him. You're hurting your next season by being better at him. You're not hurting the person that hurt you. They don't even know they hurt you. You're destroying yourself on the inside and opening your life to demons when you stay bitter at people who caused you harm and who caused you pain. When God tells us to forgive, it's not because what they did didn't matter. It's that what God is about to do next in your life matters more than what those people did to you. <laughs> Betrayal is what somebody did to you. Bitterness is what you do to yourself. You know sometimes when you see people they get shot and a bullet stays in their body. The infection develops from that. And what the doctors would do is they would clean that wound and when they would cleanse that, that area, it begins to heal. When bitterness stays in you, it creates an infection. Wounds neglected become wounds infected. And what begins to happen is that it started as a hurt but then it becomes a hardened heart and then you become an angry person. That person moved on. You're trapped in the cycle of the same trauma and it keeps happening to you because the devil keeps it on replay as long as you stay in unforgiveness. So while when you forgive, God doesn't change the past. He enlarges your future. When you forgive, you're not saying it didn't hurt, it didn't matter or no, no, no. What you're saying is this, it hurt but I'm trusting God to bring healing. I'm trusting God to bring justice. I am not God. I've committed sin against God and I don't want God to judge me for my sin. I want Him to have mercy on me and I will extend that mercy to those people but I will move forward in the future that God has for me. Some of us don't forgive because we're like, well, the people that hurt me have not apologized. You don't need to wait for them to apologize for you to forgive them. Jesus did not wait for the Pharisees to come to their senses and say, Jesus, we're so sorry. We just betrayed you. We lied about you and we nailed you. Jesus forgave people that crucified him and they have not asked for forgiveness. I don't remember reading in the Gospels where somebody come to Jesus at the cross and says, I'm so sorry what we did to you. But I do read in the Bible where he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Do not wait for them to come to their senses and apologize. It takes two to reconcile. It takes one to forgive. When you forgive, you're not downplaying what they did. You're not minimizing what they did. What you are saying is this, your future is more important than your past. What you are saying is God's promise is more important than your hurt feelings. And you're trusting God with your hurt, asking Him to heal you. And you're opening yourself to the future that He has for you. How to survive a storm somebody puts you in. Forgive those people who caused that storm for you. Number two, the storm might destroy your ship. Don't let it sink your faith. Book of Acts 27 verse 22, it says, But now I urge you to take heart. For while there is no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Please understand, the enemy is not after your ship. He wants to wreck your faith. The greatest loss is not when you lose your ship. It's when you lose your faith. Jesus looked at Peter and he knew Peter's about to go through some pretty trying times. And he said in Luke chapter 22 verse 32, he says, But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, Having faith and a good conscience which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. shipwreck. If you lost your ship, a ship can be a business. A ship can be a person in your life that was such a big blessing. It could be your husband, it could be your wife. And maybe you lost because they died or maybe you lost them because they walked away. Perhaps you lost an opportunity. Maybe you lost a job. And today you are looking at your life. I want you to know the enemy is not after your ship. He's after your faith. He wants you to lose your faith when you lose your ship. That's why as Christians we should never be too attached to the things in this world that we will lose either by death or by a storm. All of us are going to lose things. When you die, you're going to lose everything at once. But life on this earth is really losing things 
gaining them and losing them gaining them and losing them and then at the end of our life we're going to lose everything that's why our attachment and addiction should be to Jesus who will stay with us forever not to the ship not even to the friendships not to our job not to our business and not even to our ministry because these things are here today and they may not be here tomorrow but Jesus Christ is yesterday today and forever the same if you lose your ship don't lose your faith Come on somebody, don't lose your faith. I meet people sometimes who say, Vlad, when my parents, when my mom died, I lost my faith. And I want to say respectfully, you didn't have any faith. Why? Real faith is not in healing, it's in God. The Bible says trials of life are like fire and faith is like gold. Have you seen fire destroy gold? Fire purifies gold. But have you seen fire destroy napkins? When someone comes to me and says, Vlad, my faith was destroyed because God didn't answer that prayer. I want to say respectfully, what you had was faith in faith what you had was faith in you what you had was faith for an answer but faith in God where he died for me loves me is coming back to restore everything that faith that Bible talks about does not get destroyed when your prayers do not get answered why? Because that faith isn't built on that. It's an anchor. It gives you grounding. It gives you stability. That faith cannot be destroyed when somebody walks out of your life. It cannot be destroyed when somebody gossips about you. Why? Because that faith is gold and gold is purified by fire, not destroyed by fire. And God allowed that faith to be destroyed because He knew it. You didn't have gold, you had paper. And God isn't over there saying, ha, you didn't have faith. He says, no, finally you realize, now come and let's get you real faith. Job's wife tells Job, curse God and die. Why? Because look, nothing good is happening. But see, Job's faith was not in the ship. See, my faith is not in the ship. My faith is in the one who walks on water. My faith is the one who controls the storm. My faith is the one who rules the heaven and the earth. My faith is in the one who died on the cross. Paul says, I knew in whom I have believed. Jo Speaking so much faster that my body isn't catching up. Job said, my Redeemer lives. I know He lives. He had faith in God, not faith in faith. And I prayed for God to heal my eyes, the cosmetic part. I can see good out of four siblings and both parents. I don't have glasses and I could see really good, but I just wanted to improve my image. God didn't answer that. If my faith would have been built in God changing how skin is stretched over my skeleton, I should have walked away from Christian faith. I've been betrayed, lied about, gossiped, misunderstood, criticized and treated really poorly by Christians. Why didn't I leave my faith? Because I'm not here because of you and even for you. I'm here. He died. He lives in me. And it's His love in me for people that keeps me grounded. And I know this body will turn into ashes. Everything I have in life will still, I'm going to end with nothing. Eventually when I die, naked I come in, naked I come out. So I cannot be attached to the external things like the ship or the business or the ministry or the title or the position. Why? Because when you put your faith in that, your, paper, your faith is no longer gold, it's paper. Anything can destroy it. If you lost the ship, don't lose your faith. Don't give your faith. Don't put your faith in your position. Don't put your faith in your ideas. Put your faith in God. Now I'm not saying not to believe in yourself. What I'm not saying not to have believe in your ideas. What I'm saying, if that's what you call faith in God, is faith in you, you're the most miserable person that ever walked on this planet. You will be disappointed. I can give you a prophetic word right now. You will be disappointed. Why? Because 
you are not God. You're as stable as the weather in Seattle. It just rains all the time. You're not stable. I'm not stable. God is stable. My situations will change. My titles will change. What I live will change. How people treat me will change. How I look will change. I will have a beard next season. I will not have a beard. That will change. I didn't have kids. Now I have a child. That will change. One thing that doesn't change is God is faithful. And if I lose a ship, my faith is not going to be sunk because my faith is purified by the storms of life. It is not defined by the storms of life. Can somebody give God some praise right now? Write this down. Number three, storms don't mean God is absent. Just like clouds don't mean the sun is gone. Acts chapter 27 verse 23 and Paul continues his discourse. He says, for there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve. Saying, do not be afraid Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed God has granted you all who sail with you. I want you to see that God was with Paul. The angel of the Lord comes at night and says, I am with you Paul and don't be afraid. I will gift every person on the ship. Yet God doesn't save the ship. And sometimes this is where we trip up. We're like, well Lord if you are with me, you will save my business. Well Lord if you are with me, you will save this marriage. Please understand, God does promise to save your soul, but not always your ship. Don't get hang up on the fact that you're holding on to your ship when God is saying, I'm here, don't be afraid, I'm going to save you. You're like, no God, but what about the ship? And God says, well, unfortunately, the ship is not going to make it. <laughs> you're going to make it. <laughs> the ship ain't going to make it. But I do have a better ship for you. <laughs> The Bible says that there was a better ship that came out. <laughs> After that, they take him to Rome. And he says to Paul, because I'm with you, you will stand in front of Caesar. Sorry guys. Because I'm with you, you will stand where you're supposed to stand. Just want to encourage somebody here. The storm will delay what God, where God is taking you, but it will never cancel it. If God gave you a promise that He is going to bless that business and now maybe you're in a place where you don't even have a job. You're like, but what about the promise that God has given you? God will make it that you stand in front of Caesar, meaning that you will fulfill that word that, that God has given you. Even if there is a delay, the storm won't deny because God is with you. God's presence with you does not mean that the storm will disappear. Sometimes He walks with us through the valley. The valley doesn't turn into a mountain. He walks with us through the fire. It's just the fire doesn't hurt you anymore, but it's still there. God walks with us through the difficult seasons of our life. And this idea that atheists have developed, well, where is your God now? Well, if God is really real, you should have not went through this. Why are you going through that? Well, my Savior has scars in His hands. What about your God? Who is your God that you trust? My God, He became like me and took my sin and died for me and walks with me and leads me out of my situation and says He'll never leave me and He'll never forsake me. That is the God I serve. Who is your God? Oh, excuse me, you're talking to the universe? The universe didn't die for you. The universe didn't bleed for you. The universe isn't coming back for you. The universe is mean. Jump from a 10 story building. You see if the universe will pick you up. It won't. You will die. My God is with me. Now do not jump from 10 story building. Just, just FYI. I'll be going over there jumping and say, Pastor Vlad said, this was an analogy. Amen. The storm does not mean God is gone. I don't see the sun when the clouds come. But how many of you know the clouds aren't powerful enough to remove the sun from the universe? Your storm isn't powerful enough to separate God from you. You might feel like He is not there. But your feelings are not to be trusted when you are in the storm. They are not reliable. 
Amen. Number four, not everything God is involved in will end up in a miracle. In verse 26 of book of Acts 27, the scripture says, however, we must run aground on a certain island. Paul tells the man there, he says, God's angel came to me and said not to be afraid. He said, everything's going to be all right. Oh, by the way, the ship is not going to make it. And then he said this, he finishes this discourse to this man and he said, we must run aground, meaning the storm is going to run its course. There will be no supernatural intervention and we're going to have to do some swimming. Not everything God is doing in our life ends up in the Hollywood fairy tale ending. Most of us think if God is involved, that means the storm will stop supernaturally. Sometimes it does stop supernaturally, but sometimes God will give you strength to swim. It's not lack of faith. It's not, oh, but God just doesn't seem to be involved. The Bible nowhere in here says that God came to Paul and said, Paul, if you could have had better faith, you would have prevented this calamity. God didn't say that. God said, I am with you and don't be afraid. Don't be surprised if there will be things God supernaturally delivers you from and there will be things God will deliver you through. And you will walk through them. You'll walk through chemo. You'll walk through that thing the doctors will offer you. And you will still receive the result. It won't be supernatural miracle. But you will look back at your life and you said, had it not been for God all the way long, I would have not made it. Things don't have to be always supernatural for God to be involved in them. And we have to learn to appreciate the goodness of God and rely on His strength even if there is no big supernatural intervention. There was no supernatural intervention here. The storm ran its course. It crashed the ship. Paul landed on that, learned to swim, held on to broken pieces, got to the shore. You don't see any big supernatural story, yet in all of that process, God was with Paul. Just because God is with you, that doesn't mean every situation will have angels floating there. Gold dust coming from heaven. You hear angels singing in the room all the time. When God is with you, it doesn't mean the dollars will always be at the front of your house and every single sickness supernaturally always ends up in a miracle. Sometimes God delivers us from a storm and sometimes He chooses to deliver us through a storm. He's still our deliverer. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Number five, write this down. Don't lose your spiritual appetite in the storm or you'll face spiritual starvation. So the Bible says right after that, verse 43, but the centurion wanted to save Paul, if you could lower the microphone a little bit, kept them from, no, 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 I apologize. This is verse 34. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment. So Paul is saying, I urge you to take nourishment for this is for your survival since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. Verse 35. And when he had said these things, Paul, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. When you're in a storm, if the enemy cannot take your faith, he will seek to take your appetite. Appetite meaning you lose desire for God. You lose any desire to worship because you're so overwhelmed with problems of life. You're under the weight of the pressure of sickness. You don't want to read the Bible. You don't want to be in a community called life group because you're like, you just don't understand. I'm really not feeling it. You most likely will not feel like reading the Bible when you're in a storm you still should read the Bible anyway. 
You might not feel like lifting your hands and giving thanks to God when you feel like there is nothing to thank God for. All you want to do is complain. You should still lift your hands and worship God. You might not feel like getting dressed up and going to a small group on Tuesday night because you're like, you just don't understand what I'm going through. It's just not easy. You should still do that. Why? Because the storm will end. You won't make it if you're starved to death. The storms will end. All storms end. People don't make it till the end. Not because the ship didn't make it. It's because there was not enough strength and the strength comes from eating. You got to feed yourself with God's Word. You got to still worship and you got to still be in the community. Why? Because even if you don't feel like it, you're not a feeler. You're a believer. People say, but Vlad, you don't understand. I am a hypocrite. If I lift my hands and I don't feel like lifting my hands. Excuse me? You are a spirit and your spirit wants to lift his hands and worship God. Your flesh does not want. So are you a hypocrite when you're doing what your spirit wants? Or are you a hypocrite when you're doing what your flesh does? Because the flesh has been crucified with Jesus on the cross. So you are not a hypocrite when you're not doing what your flesh wants. You are a hypocrite when you are doing what your flesh wants. I'm not a hypocrite when I'm reading my Bible and my flesh does not want to read the Bible. No, I'm a real Christian. It's just my flesh right now is having a bad mood and does not want to read the Bible. But I'm going to finish reading that Bible. Why? Because that is the right thing. Because I believe in feeding my spirit man. Feed yourself. And this is what I've known about reading the Bible. Desire for reading the Bible comes from reading the Bible. Desire to pray comes from prayer. I don't have a desire to pray. Do you know how to get it? Start praying. I don't have a desire to read the Word. It's boring. So is your phone if you don't turn it on. It's pretty dark. Your phone is pretty dark by the way. Turn it on. And open an app. And you'll see yourself three hours later immersed in that. Open the Word. Turn on your spirit. Begin to consume it and the breath of God that's in the Word of God will begin to pull you in and you will see yourself being nourished. Paul fed other people in the storm, broke the bread and gave thanks to God. For what? For what they had? Bread? They were alive? You begin to do the same. Feed yourself spiritually, especially when you don't feel like it. If you feel like praying, make sure you pray because it's, it's bad to miss such an opportunity. If you don't feel like praying, make sure you pray because it's bad to stay in, stay in such a condition. Pray still. Push through a little bit. It's not you that doesn't want to pray. It's the flesh. It's the mood swings. It's the feelings that are speaking to you. Push through. And David sometimes had to do that. You see in Psalms, he would say, Why are you disquieted, O my soul? Meaning his soul? Had a pretty bad day. And David would go, oh yeah, I'm just going to complain today. Lay in bed, eat Cheetos and just watch soap opera. No, David says, yet I will still praise God. Yet I will trust in God. He would tell his soul, hey, come on. Worship the Lord with me. He didn't let his soul dictate his decisions. In other words, don't live in your head. Your head is not where you should be living. If you live in your own thoughts and your feelings, you're going to sink. Scripture tells us we think on these things. That means we're not our thoughts. We are a spirit and we can choose our thoughts. You are not your latest feeling. You are not your mood. You are a spirit and you can choose to rejoice in the Lord and your mood will catch up. Stop riding on the waves of your mood because it will drown you in the storm. Amen. Number six, survive the storm by holding on to what's left, not what you lost. Oh, this is good. Book of Acts 27 verse 43. But the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose, which was to kill all the prisoners, and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, and some on parts of the ship. So it was that they all escaped safely to land. 
Holding on to pieces means you don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Because worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its problems. It empties today of its strength. Let me say that again. Holding on to broken pieces meaning you don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Because worry does not empty tomorrow of its problems. It simply empties you today of the strength you need. Holding on to pieces means you count your blessings instead of your problems. You focus on what you have left instead of what you lost. God isn't gonna use what you lost. God is gonna use what you have left. The widow that had only a little bit of oil, he used that. A disciple that had a fish and, oil and, and bread, just a little bit, he used that. What you lost, God is able to bring it back. But he's not gonna use that now, it's not in your hands. God uses what you have left. We weep over what we lost, but sometimes we don't focus on what we have left. Look at what you have left. Maybe you lost your business, but you know the greatest wealth is to have good health. Maybe you lost your job, but you know that the greatest wealth is to have children that love Jesus. Did you know that the greatest wealth is to have two legs that bring you to a church, two arms that lift, two eyes that see, two ears that hear. You know that the greatest wealth is to be able to breathe oxygen without a machine. You know that the greatest wealth is when your brain doesn't lie to you about the reality through all of these mental illnesses and the fact that you have mental health. That is a wealth that you have and you don't realize that you have it because you haven't lost it. We only realize what is valuable when we don't have it anymore. When you can't walk, you begin to realize, oh my goodness, my legs are valuable. When you can't lift your hands because one of them is broken, you realize they're valuable. When you can't speak anymore, you realize how it's valuable. When you can't breathe normally and you need a, you need a machine, you realize how valuable it is. Begin to focus on what you have left instead of what you lost. I'm not saying you will have to do that all the days of your life. But there are seasons in life where you will not see the future. You're going to have to hold on to a broken piece of a ship and hold on to something by a threat until you make it to the shore. Not even think about tomorrow, not because you're careless, but because you're trusting in the very little hope you feel today. And you're taking one day at a time, one day at a time, one day at a time, and you come out of that storm because you held on to broken pieces. That's what Paul had to do. And he was a great apostle. Don't be surprised if there will be seasons and days you will have to hold on to that one piece of hope, one piece of promise and just, just, just the one little thing that you feel like you have left and that thing God will use to get you through that day, get you through that week, get you through that month and you come out of that season for His glory. Amen. And I have the last thing I want to share and I'm going to be done. If God doesn't part the sea like He did for Israel, calm the storm like He did for Jesus or send a fish like he did for Jonah. He will give you the strength to swim like he did for Paul. But he will not let you drown. I'm open to the sea parting like he did for Israel. Oh, what a great miracle it is. And it could be a great movie, great sermon. I am very open for God to send a big fish, hide me there and the fish to vomit me out on what I'm supposed to be. That's like Uber and Lyft without the payment and the driver talking to me. A lot of wet stuff inside but hey, I want to get to my destination pretty fast. I am so open to the sea being stopped by the Word of God. Be still, be silent and the storm stops. Man, that's so awesome. If none of these happen, I'm also open to put on some swimming shorts and start swimming. Because the same God who splits the seas can strengthen my hands. The same God that calms the storms can give me strength as I hold on to some pieces and get to the other side. Amen. I want to encourage you today. You will overcome that storm. And when you come out of that storm, this is what I know about people who overcome storms. They kill snakes. Paul, after overcoming the storm, shook off the snake. Sometimes people ask me, you know, what's the secret? You know, 
how do you become the demon slayer well you gotta face some things sometimes you get through them your courage gets built your experience gets built your confidence gets built in Jesus and you become more secure in who he is and those things that used to bother you don't bother you as much and you're ready for some new challenges amen everyone faced storms and but we also see every storm in the Bible came to an end so will yours it will come to an end but while you're in it feed yourself forgive those that hurt you while you're in it if God doesn't provide a supernatural way trust in his strength to get through it naturally while you're in it do not lose your appetite and don't lose your faith in him your faith will be shaken you will experience fear and doubt that doesn't mean you don't have faith natural faith normal genuine faith experiences fear don't let that fear take root trust in him even if you don't feel him it's not about a feeling it's about knowing he's with you and he loves you